Great. Hello. How are you? So, a um, couple of things before we get started. So, just, um, I know, I think I put this on the announcements, but I'll just mention it. There are a couple of people, or there were a few people, I don't know. There were, there were people, maybe, who, um, when they were creating the centered versions of their variables, inadvertently not actually getting the centered versions of their variables, had the code was not quite right, and so we're getting like all zeros or all blanks or whatever. So I think there are two things to say about that. First, whenever you create a variable, it's really important that you check to make sure that it's created correctly, right? So um, I always actually open up the file, like I open up the, you know, the data frame and I make sure and look and say, like eyeball it, yeah, okay, that looks like it was created correctly. Um, Another quick thing you can and should do is just run descriptives, like look at the mean and the standard deviation, right? If you're not getting a mean or you're not getting a standard deviation, uh, that's a surefire sign that the centering is not going correctly. If you're having trouble with the centering code, please email Jennifer or Pam or me, and we will help you out and make sure that you have code that runs the centering, because this is, you know, that's not, that is not sort of the main Point and we want to make sure we will help you trouble shoot your centering code. I don't want to do that right now, but if, if anybody is still having trouble, see Jennifer during the break or see one of us, you know, separately. Um, and uh, and we'll get that we'll get that figured out. But again, you'll know you're having a problem because your variable won't actually be a variable, right? It's not it's not creating correctly. Okay, so that was the first thing. Are there other, I feel like there was at least one other announcement. You wanted to say something about the homework, right? Or should we wait till after the break? Yeah, let's wait till after the break to talk about the homework. Okay. Okay. That's right. We'll wait till after the break. Uh, I think that's all of my announcements. So, yes? Well, it was because there was missing data. That's the that's the main issue is that there is missing data in this file and there was no missing data in the other file, right? I mean, I yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't I, like I don't even I think that's not even that important really. I would I think the na.rm is is fine and a.rd will also work. This is, that's like a level of detail of R that I think we don't need to like get into. I think that's not your problem. <laughs> Actually, it's not the, I don't believe it's the RD versus the RM problem necessarily. Uh, I think it's actually, um, well, again, I think different people could be having different problems because of the way that you write it. So that's why I'm saying, please, if you're having a problem, come see us separately. We will troubleshoot it, not in class. But but we will make sure that it works for you if that is your problem. Um, and yeah, missing data is just a little tricky, but we will get you we will get you through it. All right, lesson learned. Well, I don't know. I mean, like on one hand, maybe we shouldn't have missing data in the homework, and on the other hand, like when you have your own data, you're going to have missing data. So how frustrating would it be to come out of this class and not have a clue what to do if you have missing data? So I always struggle with what the right answer is there. Okay, onward, upward. Um, yeah, so exciting today. We're not going to do anything in R. Yay, we're taking a little break from R today. I, we'll see if you think that's exciting or not after we finish today. If you're like, please give me R again. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and, and also, oh, that was my other announcement. So what? You should take a bet. On what? You Oh, we want our back or yeah, after this, they might want our back. We'll see. Um, but uh, the other announcement is, so I was looking at the syllabus and we are running about a week behind right now, which is fine. That's that's OK. Um, so but that does mean that it sort of changes a little bit the way that we're going to do things. So my plan for today is we're going to do the predicted values lab, which I think was scheduled for last week. And then if there's time, I'm going to which I hope that there should be time. There should be time at the, at least an hour at the end of class 
we're going to start talking about reframing multi-level models as longitudinal models. So we'll talk about sort of the multi-level model for change. Um, and then their residuals were on the schedule. That was supposed to be sort of our next thing. But we're going to push the conversation about residuals until after we do our multiple weeks of longitudinal. So, so we're doing predictive values. Then we're heading into longitudinal. We have multiple weeks of longitudinal. And then we'll do residuals. And most likely scenario for what's getting cut is the week on uh, MELS, which is uh, bad because we were looking forward to that, but that's okay. It's that, the mixed effects location scale model, uh, which actually requires a whole nother R package. We decided eh, that's the thing that should go. <laughs> so, um, so that's where we are. Okay. Um, so, we got a handout here. The rut PowerPoint. Okay, so what we're going to do today, and uh, let's see, I think it's just Amanda at home. So uh, this this lab is also, boy, I think it's also posted. Tell me if it's not. I believe it's also posted on Husky CT. Okay, good. Thought I did. Um, and it's also in the courses folder. If somebody wants it electronically rather than on paper, you're welcome to do this electronically too. But but I have one, although I'll take a blank one too, I guess. Okay. So here's the thing. Um, our goals, our goals sort of for the first part of today are to make sure that we can make sense of the output that we get from R and that we can match, that we can actually write multi-level models and combined models and that we can match our multi-level and combined models to our output. Because my sense is that this is actually a place where people are having a lot of difficulties. Yes? Okay. And we're going to pair that, and this is the part where you're going to be like, oh, ooh, ooh, our back. We're also going to pair that with figuring out what prototypical predicted values are for certain types of people, which are like little mini word problems, you'll see. And we're gonna do a couple of those the long way, like either by hand or using Excel, you can do it either way. And actually that's what your homework is gonna be, is like doing some of these, writing out models and also coming up with some prototypical predicted values. But I will show you uh, next week, probably, or some week, next week or the week after, sometime in the next couple of weeks, I will show you how you can actually at least do some of the generation. You can do, you can generate some of these predicted values, actually, most of these predicted values, maybe all of these predicted values in R. Um, so once you learn how this all works, you won't always have to, you know, do this sort of the longhand way, but I think learning all the pieces of the model and how they fit together and sort of getting that into your head is actually like a worthy endeavor. And I'm hopeful that after this lab, that a lot of this stuff will make more sense. Maybe, I hope, that's the goal. Okay, so let's take a look at what we just hand, what I just handed out or what uh, Pam just handed out. And here's the first question for you. Um, we have, I took this right from, I mean, it looks a little bit prettier than an R output, but it's basically the same thing, right? I copied this right from an R output file. Uh, by the way, everything that we're going to talk about today, because um, we're talking about the equations, well, when we talk about the equations, this is maybe not as true, but once we get to the predicted values, we're really not going to be thinking about the random effects part of the equation at all. We're really mostly mostly focused on the fixed effects part of the equation and making sense of our fixed effects parameters today, right? We've spent a lot of time talking about random effects over the last few weeks and variance components, and now we're really going to spend some time on the fixed effects. So you'll notice this looks just like our output, except for that I didn't actually even put the variance components on here. I didn't put any of the other extraneous information that comes. I just literally put the, the gammas, right? The fixed effects gammas. Okay. So the first question for you, 
for all of us is, you see where it says, we have the coefficients, we have the parameter names. I've given you information about the variables right below. So we've got gender, we've got group mean centered math. Oh, actually I should mention, this is actually the same data set that you used for homework. So this should not look totally foreign to you. We've got like group mean centered kindergarten, math scores, SES group mean centered, school math, which is grand mean centered, mean SES, which is grand mean centered. And then I don't think we use this variable in our homework, but who pri is just public or private. So whether the school is public or private, okay? And I've told you, you know, they're what, whether they're centered or uncentered, right? Which ones are level one variables, which ones are level two variables. And I told you what the coding is. So for gender, one is male, and for who pri, I'll just say private, one is one is private. So the first question I have for you is, what are the gammas? Like, we've got these coefficients, we ought to be able to give all of these gammas, right? So let's do that. Help me out. What do you think? The intercept is what? Gamma not not. Excellent. Okay, good job. Yay, nailed it. That is right. That's good. I'm very happy. Okay, next one. On the output, it just says math K group C. So that's the level one group mean centered math and kindergarten score. What name would you give? To, what gamma would you give to that? Gamma one not. Yes, excellent. Why gamma? You're absolutely right. So now that you know that you're right, why gamma one not and not gamma not one? Hmm? It's the first level one variable, right? So this is gonna this is and what this is telling us is, is that it's the intercept for the level one, like that first level one variable, right? And why we say the intercept, I think will come become more apparent even more apparent than it might already be when we get into the predicted values lab or the predicted values part. Okay, so great. So that is gamma one not. Okay, next next one. Who's good at this? School math C. So now this is school mean math. Gamma gamma one, why would you say gamma one one? Which that should be a hint that I, that's not right. <laughs> what? So again, school, it's school, it's a level two variable, right? And you don't see, it's not, there's no, you've got a one, one, you're talking about a cross level interaction. It's the effect, remember, the effect of a level two variable on the effect of a level one variable on the outcome. So if you see a level two variable sitting there all by itself, it's not going to be a cross level interaction because it's the effect of the level two variable on the intercept. If it's the effect of the level two variable on the intercept, it's going to be a gamma, oh, right, zero. And we haven't done another one yet. Like, what is one and what is two is really like whichever one you hit first, right? That doesn't matter as long as then you're consistent afterward. So, but let's call this one gamma zero one because it's the first one that we've seen. Does that make sense to you? Yeah? Okay, cool. So is everybody with me why that's gamma zero one and not gamma one one now? Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, next one. We've got SES group mean centered. So that's a level one variable hanging out there by itself. What's that gonna be? Yeah, gamma two not, gamma two zero, right? Because we already used gamma one zero. If it were the first one, it could have been one, but it's the second one, so it's two, and it's the intercept of that. Uh, it's the intercept of that, and so it's gamma two zero, right? Okay, next one. Now we've got mean SES centered. Mean SES is a level two variable, and it's, it's a level two variable, the effect of the level two variable on the randomly varying intercept, so it's, Gamma not two, excellent, good job. Okay, now, uh, public private, level two variable. Yep, 
Gamma naught three, good, excellent. Gamma naught three, right? Because it's the effective public private on the randomly varying intercept. Next one, math K group C by school math C. So the first thing you need to do when you see any kind of like an interaction term, this is really important, is you've got to say to yourself, hey, are those two variables at the same level or are they, are they at different levels, right? Because if you have two same level variables and they're at level one, then it's gonna get its own first index, right? It's like, for example, if these were two level one variables, we've used gamma one naught and gamma two naught. So if these were two level one variables interacting, this would be gamma three naught, right? And if these were two level two variables interacting, predicting the randomly varying intercept, we've gotten up to gamma naught three, so this would be gamma naught four, right? You with me? But it's neither of those two things. If you look at it, it is a cross-level interaction. We've got school mean math centered, right? And it's moderating the effect of math group mean centered, right, on the outcome. So it's a cross-level interaction, yeah? Okay, and now I have to say to myself, okay, it's a cross-level interaction, so it's going to be, but I need to make sure that I use the right first index, because which level one variable does it go to? Does it go to the one, it, it, does it go to the one that we use the subscript of one for, or the one that we use the subscript of two for? One, right? So math K group C, right, that was our, that was our gamma one naught, so here we're going, Okay, right, that's, this is going to be the effect of school math centered on the effect of math K group mean centered. So that's going to be gamma one one. Excellent. Good job. Gamma one one. Yay. It's a cross level interaction. So it's the effect of school mean, it's the effect of school mean math on the effect of uh, uh, on the effect of um, kindergarten math on fifth grade math, right? So this is like the effect of the school math, the, the effect of the school's overall math score in kindergarten on the effect of like on sort of that math slope, which is the effect of a kid's kindergarten math score on their fifth grade math score. So how well does kindergarten math predict fifth grade math? Yeah, 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 because it is always, the level two variable is always the moderator variable. It's a cross-level interaction. It's always the level two variable that is moderating the effect of the level, like it's, it's moderate, we have these. So what we're really saying, again, just to remind ourselves is we have, we're saying uh, that there could be different, there could be different slopes for kindergarten math on fifth grade math achievement, which means that the kindergarten math scores of kids could be differentially predictive of their fifth grade scores in different schools, right? That's what we're saying. And we're saying maybe, maybe that differential prediction ha is a function of the overall school average on math. So maybe it is that schools that have higher, maybe in schools where kids start out higher in math in general, maybe kindergarten math score is less predictive of fifth grade math, right? Or, or it could be, it could be the opposite, right? It could be so, and we, we can see that once we get. Well, actually, we can see it right now. Let's look at this coefficient and see what it means. Okay, we got negative 0.09, right? And to really interpret that, I need to think about also what is the sign of the math, the SES group C slope, which is positive. So the SES. Oh, it's no, it's not SES. We're sorry. We're in math K, my bad. Math K, it's also positive, but the math K slope is 1.33. So that means in a school of average mean SES that, um, that for every point higher a kid scores in terms of their kindergarten math score, right, within their school, for every point higher they are as compared to other kids in their school, right, relative to kids in their school because it's group mean centered, but for every point higher, that a kid scores over their school's average, then we would, in kindergarten, we're expecting them to score 1.33 points 
higher in fifth grade math. Again, this is for a school of average mean SES. And that's holding, it's a, it's a regression, so that's, you know, holding everything else constant, right? Or after, you know, right? After controlling for the other variables in the model. But this cross, so is everybody with me? So basically, higher kindergarten math scores predict, in kinder, higher kindergarten math scores predict higher fifth grade math scores. That's not surprising. But now, what does this cross level interaction mean? Yeah? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Hold on. Share the screen. Oh, it's right here. I just need to share the screen. Share screen. Shoot, there it is. Screen one. Share. Okay, here we go. Okay, so now we're sharing the screen. So going back to that. So again, so higher kindergarten math, again, in a school of average mean SES, higher kindergarten math scores predict higher fifth grade math scores, right? Make sense? Okay, great. So now, this is interesting though. Look at this cross-level interaction. It's actually negative, right? So what does that mean? That means if a school that's above the mean in terms of, I'm looking at the right one, right? Yeah, math K. I just have to keep making sure I don't look at SES inadvertently. So, so they're both negative, so I guess we're okay there too. So in a school that has higher, like higher kindergarten math scores than the overall average, that slope, that positive slope that says, you know, that says that kindergarten math predicts fifth grade math, that slope is actually more negative. So it's attenuated, it's less positive, it's more negative. How much more negative? Well, for every point higher on mean SES, I expect that slope to be 0.09 points lower, right, than what it was at the intercept. So for example, if I had a school that is, no, I meant to say math, uh, kindergarten math. I'm so sorry, I don't know why I keep doing that. I meant to say kindergarten math. So thank you. If I do that again, just call me out. I don't know why I'm like swapping them out in my head. So, so for every point higher on kindergarten math that a school is, right, we expect the, that their slope, which is telling about the relationship in that school between kids SES and their math, kids kindergarten math achievement and their fifth grade math achievement, we expect that to be 0.09 points lower than it was. Not negative, right? Because the intercept is positive. So for example, um, we're saying in an, at, we would predict in an average mean math, kindergarten mean math school that, um, that it's 1.33, in a school that's one point above the average in terms of kindergarten math scores, we would expect it to be 1.33 minus 0.09, right? Which would be like 1.24, which doesn't sound like very much, but now imagine what if it's 10 points, right? If, it's, if this school is 10 points above the overall mean in terms of kindergarten math achievement, now I would say I would take that negative 0.09, I multiply it by 10, and now I have negative 0.9, right? And then negative 0.9 plus 1.33 gives me 0.43. So in a school where the kindergarten math achievement is 10 points higher than the overall average, I'm still predicting that kindergarten math scores would positively predict fifth grade math scores, but that slope is less steep. It's less positive, right? It's still positive, but it's flatter than it was, which means that in higher mean math, higher starting schools, right? Schools that have higher starting scores in kindergarten, the relationship between kindergarten math scores and fifth grade math scores isn't, like it isn't as strong, right? That slope isn't as steep. Does that make sense? And again, this is, this is like after, because it, it is regression, it is after controlling for the other variables in the model, right? Because again, this, we also have mean SES in there and we have SES, so this is, you know, 
holding constant, you know, SES and mean SES. Um, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter because an interaction is just a multiplicative term. And so mathematically, it doesn't really matter if you multiply the first by the second. My sense is, although I've not like read this anywhere or done a huge search, but like just from what I've seen, it looks like in R, it's when it's a cross level interaction. I, or maybe I did this. I can't remember. No, I probably, it's probably the way I did it. I take that back. No, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it doesn't matter. But I have the first, like in this case, I have the level one, one first and the level two, one second, but now I don't know. That might, I, I think that, I don't know if that's the way, I don't know if that's because that's the way I wrote it in the model or if R defaults to that, but it doesn't really matter. No, 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 no. Whatever, whichever, in whichever order they are, it's a cross-level interaction. So whether you had the level two variable multiplied by the level one variable or the level one variable multiplied by the level two variable, it's still a cross-level interaction and still the moderational effect of the level two variable on that level one slope. So don't let it throw you if the level two variable shows up first, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter the actual ordering of that multiplicative. But the logic, if it's a cross-level interaction, is always the same. It's always the moderational effect of a level two variable on a level one slope. The first digit corresponds to the level one variable. Right, and they are partial regression coefficients, just like you would get in regression. And so I'm I'm saying that because if I didn't have mean SE, if I didn't have SES and mean SES in here, I wouldn't get the same coefficients for the effect of kindergarten math achievement on on uh, fifth grade math achievement. My guess is, I know for a fact actually that those are collinear. That there is there is a correlation between like kindergarten math achievement and SES, both at the individual level and at the school level. And because those are correlated, there's shared variance there, right? So what your regression coefficients that, I mean, again, this is just a, like a regression thing. What the regression coefficients that you get in a regression model are always, you know, conditional on or sort of holding constant the other variables in the model. So that's why I say this is the effect of like kindergarten math achievement on fifth grade math. Well, actually, we were talking about the cross-level interaction. So it's the effect of school mean kindergarten math achievement on the effect of math achievement in kindergarten on fifth grade math achievement. Again, sort of holding SES constant, right? Or after controlling for SES. It's, it's, yeah, we're controlling for SES both at the individual level and at the, at, and at the um, school level, cluster level. And we're also controlling for, you know, private school as well. Yeah. Controlling for doesn't really have anything to do with centering. Whether we, I mean, I shouldn't say that. It doesn't have anything to do with centered or uncentered, right? When we when we group mean center something, there's no way we if we group mean center something at level one, there's no way to control for anything that's like level two because we've taken out the level two variance, right? So when you group mean center something, there's no way that a group mean centered variable can explain variance at level two. But an uncentered variable or a grand mean centered variable at level one could potentially explain both level one and level two variants. We talked about that, right? 
A level two variable really can only really level two variables could explain between cluster variability in either the randomly varying intercepts or in in slopes, right? So, um, but yeah. So, so sort of how that control operates, obviously, sort of somewhat depends on the level of the variable, but we are always really, you know, when we build a model, we're always really controlling for the other variables in the model. And the one, the one caveat is, again, group mean centered variables really can't explain any level two variance, and which is why we are always very fastidious about making sure that we put the group mean back in at level two. Otherwise, like, you've only got half the story, yeah. First digit always corresponds to like where we are in the model. Yeah. So so the first digit, the zero is the intercept, right? So gamma not not is, if you want to think of it this way, it's the intercept of the intercept, right? So zero is like the intercept, right? And then one then we're gonna go through and the next set of indexing on the first variable is always gonna be the level one, like the index for the level one variable. Then the second index is the same thing. Zero is the intercept, it's the intercept for that slope. And then, and then we index like those cross level interactions, the effect of the level two variable on the, like on that level one slope. So I, I'm not sure if I answered your question, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what your question was, but does that make sense? Zero one is the effect of that first level two variable on the intercept. Yeah. Exactly. So zero zero is the intercept of the intercept, right? And then we go through the variables. And then the second one is, again, the first is always going to be the intercept. And then we go through the level two variables. So think of it as zero is always telling you that it's an intercept, whether, you know, right? And then, and then we sort of go through the variables one at a time. Level one variables for that first set of indices, level two variables for the second set of indices. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, because this, and this is a model, right? Like we're, we're simultaneously jointly estimating everything all together. So you would not necessarily get the same regression coefficients if you were to take any one of these variables out of the model, right? I mean, depends on, I mean, they might change a little, they might change a lot, right? But yeah, so all of this is jointly estimated. All right, good. Okay, where were we? Okay, we got another. So now we've got S. Now finally we've got SES. Now I can talk about SES. So we've got SES group mean centered by mean SES grand mean centered. So is that a same level interaction or a cross level interaction? Cross level interaction, right? It's the effect of mean SES on the effect of individual, like you know, within school SES on math achievement, right? So this is a cross level interaction. So, and, and SES, when I was looking at SES as a level one variable, what index did I give it? Two, right? And this is the first level two variable that's playing into a cross level interaction, right? With my level one variable. So what am I gonna call this gamma? Not gamma two, two, right? Cause we had, we, did we have a gamma two one yet? Not gamma one two, gamma two one, right? The two, the first two is because it has to do with SES. So you could like go back up on your paper and be like, oh, SES group centered, I called gamma two zero. So this thing, because it's about SES group centered, I know it's going to be a gamma two something, 
right? Do I have any up, like I have a gamma two knot, which is the intercept for SES group centered. Do I have any other gamma two anything yet? No, I don't. So this is gonna be the first level two variable that's a cross level interaction with that level one variable. So it's gamma two one. Does that make sense? No, you don't, because you don't have to, no, you don't, because, and you don't have to have the same predictors in each of those models. You don't have to have the same set of predictors of the intercept as for, like, each of the randomly varying slopes. And so, I mean, like, again, would it be, like, earth-shatteringly bad if you called it gamma 2-2? Two, two? No, because there isn't any other gamma 2-2. Two, two. You just wouldn't have a gamma 2-1. Would the world go on? Like, you know, in, in, in sort of in a grand scheme of things, it wouldn't make that much difference. But the way that pe people, but it does need to be a gamma two something and not a gamma one something. That would make a lot of difference. And when we index, we tend to start with zero for the intercept and then we just go up and, you know, it's like the first level two variable predicting the slope, the second level two variable predicting the slope. So if you said gamma two two, the problem is that other people would look at that and be like, well, where's gamma two one? And you'd be like, I don't have a gamma two one, right? So that would be that would be the issue. Like it would still uniquely identify that cross level interaction, but it'd just be weird because you have a gamma two two without a gamma two one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like again, if you did that, you would get unique things. So like it wouldn't. If you did something like that on your homework, it's not gonna like we're not gonna be like, oh my god, those indices are wrong, right? But I mean. But like, if you tried to publish something like that, that's exactly right. The reviewers would be like, what the heck? Why is there a gamma two two and no gamma two one? You know, so. The main, the first one identifies which level one variable, right? And zero is, I start with the intercept. And then one is the, the first level one slope. Cause it's really going with the slope. The first level one slope, the second step level one slope, the third level one slope, the fourth level one slope, and again, the order doesn't matter there, but once you've set an order, you stay with it. And then the second one is about the, it's really about the level two variable moderating in the case of the intercept with like gamma not one, it's the level two variable predicting the intercept, right? Or sorry, gamma not one. So gamma not one, the level two variable is, is predicting the intercept, right? Gamma one one, this level two variable is predicting the first slope, right? Gamma two one, this level two variable, this first level two variable is predicting the second level one slope. Test the moderating impact of the on the level as yet. Yeah, I don't have, I mean, I could have had that in my model. I don't have every potential interaction in my model that exists, right? This is, this is my model. That's something you could have in the model, but it doesn't happen to be in this model. That's right. Okay. So last, I, okay. Oh, and this is negative, right? So again, we see the same thing that SES positively predicts math achievement in average mean SES schools. Right, and what was the effect of SES on math achievement? Uh, okay, so it was 4.17 points, but then the effect of mean SES on that SES slope is negative 1.46, which is saying, right, for every point, and what a, what is a point? I don't know, I don't know. We haven't talked about that yet or thought about that yet, but this is saying like, for every point higher a school is on mean SES as compared to the overall average, I would predict their SES slope to be 1.46 points lower than what the intercept of the SES slope was. So I'd take that 1.42 minus 1.46 and I would get, uh, not 1.42, sorry, 4.17 minus 1.46 and I would get uh, 3.6 something, right? So, so, so that means that that SES slope is flatter in higher SES schools. It's less positive. It's, it's right. It's more negative, but it's still positive. 
because I started off with a 4.17. And you could be asking yourself like, okay, a one point increase, is that, because remember, these are all unstandardized. Is a one point increase, is that a big increase or small increase? How do I make sense of that? And that's an important piece too. So that's why I give you the standard deviations of the variables right underneath. So let's see, for mean SES, a standard deviation is basically 0.57 points. So that means that a one unit increase in mean SES is almost two standard deviations, like a change of almost two standard deviations. So that would be comparing a school that's at the mean on SES to a school that's almost two standard deviations above the mean on SES. And let's imagine a normal distribution. If you're thinking almost two standard deviations above the mean on SES, you're getting out on the, you know, sort of out toward the edge of that bell curve, right? Um, so that's a, so a one unit change in this case is a really big change. Now compare that to like, what about a, a one point change in math, kindergarten math score? Well, the standard deviation for kindergarten math is 7.98 points. So it's basically virtually eight points. So a one point change in terms of kindergarten math score is really only about an eighth of a standard deviation unit change, right? So that's why, you know, you can look at these coefficients and you can't, you can't really sort of know exactly whether they're for the same reason that it's hard to look at unstandardized coefficients in regression, you can't really know if they're big or small until you put them into sort of practical terms, right? And so even though it, you know, it looks like that is huge, that negative 1.46, to get a change of negative 1.46 would be going from the mean to going to almost two standard deviations above the mean. So I never expect more than, like I wouldn't have a two point change, right? Like a two point change would put you almost four standard deviations above the mean. And that would be like, I probably don't even have any schools that extreme in my sample, you know? And I didn't put minimum and maximum scores for each of those, these, but that's also like a helpful thing to look at when you're thinking about, because again, we're gonna be looking at prototypical predicted values. So, you know, I would want to be, when I'm thinking about predicted values, I wanna predict values that exist in my data set, right? Like I wouldn't wanna be like, uh, what would be the slope in a school that's 10 points above the mean on mean SES? Because 10 points above the mean on mean SES would be like 18 standard deviations above the mean on SES. And there, I'm sure there's not a school in my sample that is that. So then I'd be like predicting and extrapolating out of the, you know, outside the range of my data, which doesn't make any sense, right? So when we think about making these predicted values, we really do have to kind of understand the metrics of things that we're measuring and like what is sensible and makes sense. Yeah? Okay. All right, so last one. Mean SES by private. Is that a same level interaction or a cross level interaction? Same level interaction, yeah, because mean SES is at level two and public versus private is at level two. So this is a same level interaction of level two variables. So what am I gonna call this? It's gonna be the, this, it's this predict, it's the same level interaction between public private and mean SES predicting the randomly varying intercepts, right? Gamma not four, exactly. Does everybody see why that's gamma not four? Because it's, it's two level two variables. Their interaction predicting the randomly varying intercept. The intercept is the knot, right? And this is my fourth, you know, my fourth level two variable set thing, right? How about if this were a same level interaction of two level one variables, which we don't have here, but if these were both level one variables, what would it be? Yeah, it would be gamma three naught, right? Because we didn't do a gamma three naught yet, right? We, we got to gamma two. So we, this would be gamma three. Yeah, good, okay. All right, so that's awesome. Next question. Okay, let's write the multi-level equations that would produce 
the output above. So I'll ask you, do you want to try it yourself first? Do you want us to do it all together first or not? What do you think? Who's, who's, who thinks they're brave enough to give it a go all by themselves? Okay. Yeah? All right. So let's take like five minutes. Okay. We'll do a, like a short period of time. Take five minutes and write out. Now, remember, not the combined equation. If you get done with the multi-level equations, you can go to the combined equation because that's the next question. I want you to be able to write it both ways. So I want you to first write out the multi-level equations and then after that, the combined equation. But take a few minutes, do it, and then we'll do it together and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Yes. Yeah, I didn't say anything about the random effects here. Let's just assume that there's a randomly varying intercept and no other randomly varying slopes, just for simplicity. Sure. All right. There we go. Zoom recording. Zoom recording. All right. So what have we got? I'm going to write this on the board. Gee, if this is like middle school, I have to be a little bit right what you did. I mean, I didn't do it, but you tell me what to write. I wasn't doing it because I didn't know I was going to get called to the board. All right. <laughs> so we've got YIJ, right? Yeah. Is Beta not J, I level one. Okay, plus, I think I need to do this. One J, center, plus beta two J. Center. Okay. Plus R I J. Okay. So now, yeah, everybody got level. Everybody got level one. Yeah. Why would you, why would you ever be included? Just making sure you're using this as output. Just making sure. There's no just like Yeah, sorry. It's it's like, but it's not. Just making it's, making it's, making it's, it's a variable because in our second example, we use gender. But in this example, we don't use gender. So you would not put gender in here because it's not my model, right? Just taking this output and we're making this model. So no gender. But if gender were in here, it would be beta 3j, right? But it's not in here because we don't have a coefficient. Okay. So now what we're doing, right, is we're taking our betas and now we've got the not j is equal to gamma not not, right? And remember that implicitly, by the way, whenever we have intercepts, I mentioned this once before, we're like implicitly multiplying them by one, right? same thing. But again, you'll see this kind of come up later on. So gamma not not, okay, plus gamma not one times school math center. Okay, yeah, just, just make sure my order is right here. Plus gamma not two times mean SES center, right? Plus gamma not three times public private plus gamma not four times the mean SES C times public plus not J because I said that the intercept was randomly varied. 
right? Can everybody have this for the intercept? Okay. Great. So now there was a question. Oh, question. Yes. Now we're going to do, right? Now this, we're going to do beta 1j equal to gamma 1 naught, right? Plus we've got gamma 1 1 times school math k. And I said that, I mean, again, if you, you know, I said quickly at the end there, let's just say that the intercept is randomly varying and none of the slopes are randomly varying. And because I said none of the slopes are randomly varying, I'm not going to put a U, a plus U sub 1J, right? The plus U sub 1J is what tells me that the slopes are randomly varying. And by the way, this is what we would call, I mentioned this once before, but I'll mention it again. This is what I would call a non-randomly varying slope. Why do I call it non-randomly varying? Because it does vary. It, this, if I just had this, then I'd be saying, that everybody, every, right, like everybody's got the same slope or every school's got the same slope. But here I'm saying, right, that slope does vary as a function of school kindergarten math score. So it is varying, but it's not randomly varying because I don't have a U sub 1J there. So it does vary, but it doesn't, there's no random variation over and above like whatever the systematic variation is that's due to the school math K being the moderator of that slope. Yeah. Okay. And finally, beta two J is equal to gamma two naught plus gamma two one times E S E S. And again, we said that this was not gonna we weren't gonna make that randomly varying. And so there we have it. And that's it. Those are my multi-level equations. And if you're confused where she has school math came back to be school. Like in school your math, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. It should be school in math. Case, I figured you guys probably knew that, but just clarity. I know that's the it's the variable names that'll kill you, right? Yeah, sure. Go for it. <laughs> Can you get it from there? Question, yes. Uh -huh. What a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Where? Wait, wait, wait. So the, well, the, there are three interactions here. Where are there? That's a great question. I need another color. Oh, my colors. Ah, here we go. I want red or something here. Okay, here we go. So where are my three interactions? Well, here's my main level interaction, right? You see it right there. ESCSC by public private. Okay. Where are the two cross level interactions? Gamma one one, gamma two one, right? Because Remember when I go back, which is going to be the next thing that you do, when I go back and substitute all of this into the combined equation, I'm going to take this whole thing, right? And I'm going to substitute this whole thing in right up here. And when I do that, I'm going to get gamma 2 naught, right? Plus gamma 2 1 times I'm just mean S E S C right times S E S C right and then when I do that out what that really means is I'm gonna get gamma two dot S E S E S C plus gamma two one times SES <laughs> K 
steer board in the way. Um, but you see this, right? This is my cross level interaction. And you see that the intercept gets multiplied, right? The intercept is, you know, over here is like, again, this is sort of implicitly multiplied by one here, but then it actually gets multiplied by SES root mean centered up there. Yeah. And that's why we call it like the intercept of the slope, right? Because it, like it, it is, it's an intercept. Intercept of the slope rather than an intercept. So that's where our two cross level interactions are hiding. They don't look like interactions right now, but they're going to look like interactions next because the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to take this multi level equation and you're going to write out the combined equation. Yes, well, better do it now because you didn't do it again for homework. Yeah. <laughs> do this. So Subtle hint. <laughs> now, what we're doing right now, by the way, is exactly identically what you're going to do today. You will ace the homework. Okay, so now take this multi level equation and turn it into a combined equation. And I'll give you a couple minutes to do. I think that'll go faster, but we'll give you a few minutes to do that. All right, and I will again pause the recording. Don't leave it. Here we go. All right, so Jennifer is writing the combined model on the board back there. And we made it nice and easy because we only have a randomly varying intercept. Now, moving those U's around, right? Well, I mean, again, like, do you have to rearrange the U's together? I have to. It's one of those things that people tend to put all the random like effects at the end of the equation. But like, it's not like it's technically wrong to have a random intercept, you know, in or a random slope in the in the middle. It's just more like that's easier to see. It. It's just yeah, that's just the way it's done. It's easier to see it, and and it also I think does. It's helpful because it does kind of correspond to the way that you're writing the code. Because remember, you're always talking about the fixed effects in the first part of the code, and then you're talking about the random effects in the second part of the code. So if you have them all together, it's easier to think about. But like technically, I mean, if you have a bunch of additive terms in an equation, it doesn't really matter what the order is. Like, started the recording. I did. I did start the recording. So I have twenty four seconds. When am I ever going to use an intersect in my life? And, you and I was like, I have spent the last eight hours talking to people about slopes and intercepts. There you so go. I'm not, You're not the person to ask. Time. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, so we've got we've got gamma not not everybody right plus gamma not one times school math plus gamma not two times mean SES plus gamma not three times public private. Plus gamma not four times mean SES times public private, right? So that's like that's easy. That's all substituted in for the beta not j. And now when we substitute in for beta one j, we get gamma one not times again, we get the gamma one not times math. Got gamma one not. Math root centered plus gamma one one times school math centered times math root centered. Talked about what the what the second one is, but again we take this two j and gamma two not uh, gamma two not times SES plus gamma two one times mean SES times SES root mean centered, right? Plus, oh, put our, put, 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 put our plus U, yeah. I mean, technically we should probably put plus U and plus R, right? So plus U sub not J plus R sub I J, which again, we weren't so worried about that, if, but that's, I know. Thank you. I appreciate that you did it. Thank you very much. Okay. So, that is mine. Thank you. So, is everybody good on how we do that? 
Right. Cool. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so I was just saying that, that like, it doesn't matter. I mean, technically they're all additives. So in some sense, you could put these in any order you want, but by tradition, people put the fixed effects first and then the random effects. And I, you know, like, again, would you lose points if you had the U somewhere in the middle? No, you would not. But by convention, people put the U's at the end. And I think it's a good practice because, because when you're writing the code, you, you remember we have like the fixed effects part of the equation and then we have the random effects part of the equation. That's what goes in that second set of parentheses. So if you put it at the end, it makes it much clearer to you what you need to be putting in for your random effects. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so remember R over here our level so this is like this is like okay here's person i and here's j and i could predict I, mean, I could predict their score think of this as like a regular regression i could predict their score based on like you know all of this stuff right and it's going to actually get combined so that's really all of this stuff but i have what i have at the end of the day is like a predicted y to my j, which would be a function of like everything that's in that equation, right? But but their predicted score isn't necessarily their actual score. So take y to my j minus like whatever their predicted score is, and that's going to give me the error for that person, right? So it's like the difference between the person's actual score and their model predicted. So, and again, this is just like regression. Right? I have a regression. I have regression. I have predictors. I predict people's scores. Some people's scores I predict very accurately. Other people I'm way off on the prediction. But everybody's got a residual. If you're sitting on the regression line, your residual is zero. If you're off the regression line, your residual is something else, right? It could be positive, could be negative. That's what these R sub i j's are. They are literally the difference between a person's and their model predicted score. These are our level one residual. And remember that we take the variance of R sub i j and it is squared, right? And so that when we talk about sigma squared in our multi-level models, we're talking about the level one residual variance. Now, you not J says, okay, this is like, they, I, now it's again, another regression model, but instead of predicting individual scores, I'm predicting like, I'm predicting schools intercepts, right? Schools can have different intercepts, randomly varying intercepts, and I'm predicting schools intercept, saying like the overall intercept, plus what's the schools, like kindergarten math, Score for mean regard math. What's the school's mean NCS? Is the school public or private? And I take all of those things, I can get like a predicted, and I can get a predicted theta dot J, right? So I get some predicted intercept. And this is really the idea is this is really the difference between theta not J. About J, which is all act, is all happening at the school level. So, you know, if I had nothing in my model, remember when we talked, we talked about totally unconditional models, that I really only had like you know, gamma not not plus mu sub not J. In that case, it's really how does the school deviate from the overall average? But as soon as you start putting predictors in the model, it's really sort of how does school J deviate from what my model would predict should be the intercept for school, right? So it's the same idea. It's really this residual, but now it's at level two. It's at the school level. And some schools, my model might predict very accurately what the school's intercept is. And for other schools, it might, you know, less accurate. Some schools might be positive. Some schools might be negative. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, then, so the variance 
dot j is going to be I thought I saw a question. Was there a question? No question. Okay, how are people feeling? Does this make sense? Yeah? Okay, good. All right, ready for part two? Okay, let's go back. First, let's go back and just look at the, the information that I gave you about the variables and their standard deviation. Let me talk about that just a little tiny bit more. Remember I said that when we think about um, when we think about uh, you know how to make sense of these coefficients, we really need to think about um, what are some like logical. We don't have we don't have standardized coefficients, so we have to sort of think of a practical way to make sense of um, the model ourselves. Like you looking at these unstandardized coefficients, you don't even really know are they big or small. I mean, I know if they're statistically significant or not. Um, there are some ways that you can compute effect sizes, certain types of effect sizes, but I would say this is even like a more, this is sort of like a, think of this as what are effect sizes really? Effect sizes are trying to evaluate the practical significance of your model, right? So what's the best way to evaluate, to think about the sort of the practical significance of your model or whether a coefficient really makes a difference or not is to sort of think about plugging in some prototypical values, right? What and seeing how, you know, how a how much of a difference does that make? What does this how does this model perform for different types of people? And you know, one thing you can do that's sort of again, I call this an effect size is you can rather than you know, you don't have a standardized estimate, but you can take a standard deviation unit and you can use that as like a metric. You could say you know, I could say like, well, a high SES school, I would call a high SES school a school that's one standard deviation above the mean in terms of SES, right? Like that's high, but it's not like crazy outrageously high. And I could call a low SES school a school that's one standard deviation below the mean on SES, right? So if I know what the standard deviation on mean SES is, and I do, it's 0.568, or let's just call it 0.57, right? If I know that the if I know that SES has a mean SES has a standard deviation of 0.57, then I can say to myself, okay, well, you know, how much does being one standard deviation above the mean on SES, how much does that impact predicted math achievement, right? And I could do that, I could do that a variety of ways. I could do that holding everything else constant, and I could just sort of say, I mean, that, that would be a good idea. I could say, what if I've got a kid who's at the average for their school? Okay, because it's group mean centered. So the kid is at the average for their school. And the school, um, let's just say the school is a public school. And let's say that the SES of the school is average. So average mean SES. And let's say the kid has average SES. So, so far, right, for his school. So, so far, everything is at the end, making this nice and easy to start. So the kid is of average SES sitting in a school of average SES, okay? It's a public school. And um, the kid is doing at the average for their school on math achievement. But the school is one standard deviation above the mean in terms of math achievement. What would the predicted score for that kid be? You know, again, this is sort of like a, yeah, that would be great. Here, take some pens. What would the predicted score for that kid be? And how is that predicted score different from the predicted score for a kid who sits at a school that is also of average kindergarten math achievement? So let's actually start with the first one. If a kid is sitting in a school that has average kindergarten math achievement, average uh, SES, and the kid is of average SES, for his school and the kid is of average math achievement for his school and it's a public school, what is the predicted score for the kid? Well, the one that's not gonna be zero is school mean SES. And it's gonna be point. Oh no, sorry, school mean kindergarten math. I'm bad, my bad. School mean, okay. yeah, school mean, school mean kindergarten math. Okay. So 
So did everybody hear what Katie just said? Because she was right. I said if if the if the kid were at the mean for the school and the school were at the mean for school math in kindergarten, right? If that were also a zero, imagine imagine I put it in green for a sec. Um, if that were also zero, right? So now it's an average kid in an average school. And if that school is average in terms of both SES and kindergarten math achievement, and the school is a public school, then everything there would be zero. And what would the predicted value for that kid be? It would be the intercept, right? Which would be 115.21. So write 115.21 down, just so we can remember that. So this is like an average SES kid for his school in an average, uh, average, well, he is average SES, an average math achieving kid for his school in an average school on both of those things, all average. Okay, so now let's imagine that that kid is still average for his school, okay, or her school, their school, average for their school, but their school is one standard deviation above the mean in terms of kindergarten math. What is the predicted score for this kid now? Okay, well, I can do that pretty easily, right? I know it's, so school math, I'm gonna plug in, uh, if it's one standard deviation above the mean, I need to know what the standard deviation is. And it's 0.5, let's call it 0.57. We're gonna round to two decimal places to make our lives easier. 0.57 is what we're plugging in for school math centered. Okay, and then plug in 0.57 there. Okay, great. And I want you to notice there. What? Oh, did I? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Wait a minute. Hold on. It is school math 5.1. My bad. My bad. I don't know why I keep like mixing up with SES. It should be 5.12 instead of 0.57. Like I've got this death wish with SES. I don't know why. Okay, so my bad. It is 5.12. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so but notice what happens here then. So 5.12, right? Great. Plus zero, 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 lots of zeros. And then look at what happens with the gamma 1.1. One, one. The gamma 1.1 one, one is 5.12, but because the kid is at the average at their school, that 5.12 gets multiplied by zero, right? So really what I end up getting for the predicted value for this kid who is still at the average in terms of kindergarten math achievement for his school, but whose school is one standard deviation above the mean in terms of uh, kindergarten math achievement is what? What would the predicted score be? Oh, I brought a calculator for school. Oh, here it is. I already got it out. Okay, so, okay, so I'm going to go 115.21 plus uh, 5.12, right, equals 120.33. So an average, a kid who's average for his school, who's sitting at a school that is a standard deviation above the mean on math achievement would be predicted to have a score of 120.33. Everybody with me there? Which, I 5.12, well, not one, it is, 5.12 is, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, you do. I'm, I'm like spacing it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 5.12. 5. Yes, I'm, I'm not thinking. Uh, gamma not one school mean math. Hold on. 5.12 times. What is it? 1.14. Thank you very much. I don't know what I'm thinking here. 1.14. No, that's mean SES again. 1.33. No, that's the group mean centered. Hold on. It's. School math, see, 1.42. I know, this is the thing that'll drive you up a wall, actually. What? No, 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 you just have to be really careful. Well, you should do that. That's fine. 1.42 times 5.12, thank you. So 1.42 times 5.12 is, okay, this is why I need my calculator. 1.42 times 
5.12 equals 7.27. 7, go ahead and put 7.27 plus 115.21 is equal to 122.48. Thank you. Okay, so we're good. So now 122.48, that's a kid who's at their average, right? In a school that's one, one standard deviation above the mean. And again, notice that notice that, that cross-level interaction is not playing in, is not playing a role at all. Now next. What if this kid, what if this kid is, I don't know. Yeah, keep those, we need those. And actually put the gamma one one up there so we don't forget about it. So gamma one one for the cross-level interaction is, let's see, I've labeled them, negative 0.09. Oh yeah, this is a good one. I like this, negative 0.09. So again, notice, this is really interesting because uh, get rid of the zero there for the group mean centered. We're going to change this kid up. We're going to make this kid. Yeah, yeah, this kid's not going to be at his school's average anymore. Do you want the kid to be above average or below average for his school? Above? Okay. So let's say that this kid is one standard deviation above their school's mean. Okay. And uh, so I got it on kindergarten math. So now I got to go. Math K group C, the standard deviation is 7.98. So we're going to put in 7.98, right? And 7.98, yep, good. And also, um, we need gamma 1 naught. Gamma 1 naught is 1.33, right? Okay, great. So now we've got now. So now we've got this situation. So let's let's look at these pieces. So look at this gamma one. Look at the five point one two times seven point nine eight. Right. Times seven point. Nine, eight, right? Times negative point oh nine is three negative three point six eight. So this this whole do you see where I am? This whole thing here. This whole that whole thing. Negative 3.68. Because we've got the kid is 7.98 points above his school's mean. The school's mean is 5.12 points above the overall mean, right? That's where we get those two. And then we take the gamma 1, 1. And what's really interesting about this is that it's negative, right? So it's negative 0.09. So the kid is above the school mean, and the school mean is above the overall mean, but because this is negative, this ends up being negative 3.68, which means actually that that's gonna end up like lowering the predicted value for the kid, right? But I mean, that's not the only piece that goes in there. That's negative 0.368, but now we also have this piece, this main effect. So this is like the interaction, it's like the cross-level interaction effect, but now we gotta figure yeah. out the main effect the main effect is 7.98 times 1.33 equals 10.61, right? This is 7.27. Yeah, but before we do that, let's talk about this 10.61, right? 10.61 minus 3.68 equals 6.93. So this whole piece of the gamma not, sorry, gamma one not plus gamma one one is 6.93 points. So the kid, right, that, that whole piece is plus 6.93. So it is positive, but it's like not as positive as it would have been if he had gone to a school of, right, uh, if he had gone to a school, let's say, that had average mean, 
as the average mean math achievement, although you wouldn't then get the mean math achievement boost. So then you've got to kind of look at you've got to look at all those moving pieces together to kind of figure out, well, yeah, is he better is he better off or not better off? So now we've got the school math is the 1.42 times the 5.12. Is that right? Is that the seven point? Did I already do that? We did that in the last yeah, one. we did that in the last one. So we got that, right? So now we just add so I have the total from the last. Yeah, year. so now we can just take the 6.93, which is 1.1.2.48 1 plus 6.93 equals 129.41. Right? So this is, so what was our last one again? That was an average kid? English is all average. All average. On school, right? But it was an average kid. So now we've got an above average kid in an above average school. And you can see that the above average kid in the above average school, the score goes up by almost seven points, right? His predicted value is almost seven points higher than it would have been if he had been an average kid in an, in a, in an above average school. Everybody with me? Yeah. I mean, I would use all of those as descriptors. You're talking about a kid who's average on, he's average for a school on SES in a school that's of average SES. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you could say whole, or I mean, maybe there might be times where you could sort of say holding these other things constant at there at their means or whatever, but, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, they, they are sort of prototypical kids. Right. And this is, this is a kid. This is a kid in a public school too. What if this kid went to a private school? Let's say this kid goes to a private school now. Okay. So now we're going to change public private to 1. Our gamma, not 3. Our gamma, not 3 for private is 2.58. Up there, right? And then remember, we've also got an interaction between mean SES and private. That's right. So mean SES, oh, but that's still zero. well, it would still would have been zero because, yeah, but now mean SES C here, though, isn't zero anymore, though, right? Oh, no, mean SES. Yes, yes, you're right. I keep doing it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know why I keep doing that. It's, yeah, it's still zero. It's still zero. It's mean SES, not mean school kindergarten. Okay. That's right. Here, the only difference is the kid goes from public to private. So that's really easy to see. That's going to give him another boost of 2.58 points, right? So we're saying, like we're saying, a kid who looks just like that, who goes to a private school, we would predict to do 2.58 points better than a kid who looks like that, who goes to a public school. Okay. So let's. Let's, okay, let's do one last thing. Let's mess with SES and then we'll take a break. Okay, so let's say the kid is at the average for their school on SES. Let's not mess with that. Oh, well, no, we should mess with that, I guess. Uh, let's say that the mean SES of the school is one standard deviation above the mean. So, yep, so it's going to be 0.57. Gamma not two is 1.14, right? Good, okay. And now mean SES there has got to be 0.57. That's right. And then, uh, and then look, we've also got mean SES, we've got gamma two one, right? It is point, we say 0.57, okay. The gamma not four is seven point four four. We don't, but let's put it up there anyway, just so we don't forget about it. Uh, gamma two one is negative one point four six. We have all of them up there now. We should have them all up there. I think that's helpful. Okay, so we can see this kid right who's at the mean on SES for their school, but their school is one standard deviation above the mean, and it's private. Right? So look what ends up happening. Uh, let's see. 
what what has changed so we've got the mean ses where is it mean ses by yeah by yeah so we've got mean ses right is 1.14 times 0.57 equals 0.65 Yeah, exactly. And then we've got private times mean SES, which is 0.57 times one, which is 0.57 times 7.4. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. 7.44. That's big, right? 0.57 times 7.44. Oops, wait a minute. I did something wrong. 0.5, I got a syntax error, times 7.44. Okay, that's 4.24. So notice that like, right, that one, yeah, exactly. The gamma 2, 1 is still zero because we said the kid is at the mean on in their school on SES. So we've still got a zero in there. But notice that there is like a negative sign there, right? So if the kids SES were above the mean for their school, then that whole term would actually be negative, right? So there's sort of this negative moderational effect, but again, the main effects are positive. So it's not like this is going to like necessarily overwhelm the main effects, but it is moderating this effect. And you can see that I think the other thing that's really interesting that you see here is the same level interaction between mean SES and public private, which gave us that 4.24, which means remember the public private effect was 2.58 so like in general like if you were at an average mean ses school the advantage of going to a private school was 2.58 again sort of like you know whatever holding everything else in the model the sort of the way it is but but when you when you increase the mean ses of the school that public private effect gets stronger right because you've got 0.57 times one times 7.44 which gives you, what was it, 4.24. So like in a private school where mean SES is one standard deviation above the mean, the differential between a public school and a private school that looked like that are, is actually 2.58 plus 4.24, not just the 2.58 anymore, right? On, on the flip side, if it were a low mean SES private school, like imagine it were one standard deviation below the mean. So this 4.24 would then be negative 4.24. That would actually mean that the that 2.58 that is like the intercept for the public private effect, that's like, you know, that's like the that would would actually get completely canceled out and it would be slightly negative. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So when I say one standard deviation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, so one standard deviation below, which is negative 0.57, right? One standard deviation above is positive. So what I'm trying to get at here, and then I promise I'll give you a break. What I'm trying to get at here is like, it's really, really helpful to take the model, take these values and do this. It's like a little thought experiment. What if, you know, what would a prototypical like low SES kid in a high SES school that's public look like versus a low SES kid in a high SES school that's public versus, right? And just for me, I mean, I, this, I do this to this day when I'm doing multi-level models. This is exactly what I do to make sense of my output to be able to then write the results and tell the story as I like say, okay, well, let's come up with some prototypical predicted values. You can also use these to like Sometimes it depends on what you're doing, but sometimes also really lends itself to very pretty graphs, right? Where you can show like the SES slope in public schools versus the SES slope in private schools or, or even something more complex than that. But this, you know, I will often create tables that are like prototypical, you know, predicted values for prototypical types of kids in different types of schools. And it really does help to tell the story of your data. And again, I would argue this is, this is an effect size because you pick numbers that make conceptual sense, you're making conceptual sense for your reader as to whether these effects are practically meaningful or not, right? Are you with me? Look at the last slide, thank you. <laughs> That's exactly right. This is the lawyer.
employer piece and not be kind of feels a little like being an accountant when you're keeping track of all these gammas and stuff. But at the end of the day, right, we need to be able to make sense of this and decide not just like which coefficients are statistically significant and which aren't, but like, you know, which of these things matter and which don't and how much do they matter? And because we've got all, I mean, you remember from regression, you talked, I'm sure you talked about interactions, but like, in multi-level, it's like guaranteed you're gonna have interactions. Because even if you don't have same level interactions, you've got cross-level interactions. So you've got these level two variables moderating the effects of level one variables on the outcome. And I always say when I'm teaching anything with interactions that the easiest way to understand an interaction is to like either plug in predicted values or to graph it, right? Or both. So I think it's the best way to kind of make sense of your model. Okay, so any last questions before we take a, a break? Oh, yeah, hold on. Let me see if I can remember. The scenario for the last one was private school. Uh, the one that we actually did on the board was high mean, it was a high mean SES private school. And then I sort of talked through what, you know, we talked through that it would be a negative coefficient if we're low mean SES. But the one that we actually did at was a high mean SES private school. But I think the kid was still at the. Everything else was the same. Yeah. If somebody wants to add those, I'll take it. Ah! I can do that. Let's see. <laughs> Is that a seven? 7.27? 7 Is that right? Plus 0.6. I don't think it's that bad. Look, they're like, yeah, you should write more. She should write less. Okay, so plus 10.61 minus 3.68 equals, I get, but somebody should double check me, I get 136.88. Thirty-six point eight. where? In total? Oh, 0.368. Is it negative 3.68? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Because that's what I typed in there. And then the last thing that I would say that you should do uh, when you're doing as a, like a check on yourself to see if you're, if you're, if you're, um, you know, if you're sort of A, doing things right, but also B, if you've picked logical sort of prototypical values is how does this compare to actually like the math achievement scores that are in our data. Because like, if you start coming up with prototypical predicted values that are outside the range of the math scores in your data, then that would suggest that those are not very good, right? Like you're extrapolating outside the range of your data. That's, those are probably too extreme, right? That's like not a fair, you don't wanna be giving predicted values that didn't occur anywhere in your data. That's like a bad idea, right? So that's why I gave you the piece of information that I did that said, Maybe I didn't give it to you. No, I did give it to you. That the outcome variable math five has a mean of 116 and a standard deviation of 20.85, and that the scores range from a low of 47 to a high of 150. So this 136.88 is high, but that's kind of to be expected because we're talking about like high mean SES school, high achieving school, high achieving kid, and it's about one standard deviation above. So that makes like that makes sense. So I look at that and I'm like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. If I did, if you did this whole thing out, and this is what I always tell my kids too, like if you did this whole thing out and you got 400, like you probably, right? Like you should double check yourself. Like if you got something like, you know, if you're slightly outside the range, maybe you just pick too extreme a value, right? But if you're getting something like negative 30 as your predicted math score or 425, I can pretty much guarantee you probably just made a silly computational error and believe you me, it is very possible. Like this is one of those places where you just have to be really careful about pulling, right? Got to pick the right coefficients, pull them out right, do blah, blah, blah. So my suggestion, by the way, for doing this kind of work is to create a spreadsheet rather than doing it all by hand. You don't have to, by the way. You are welcome to do it all by hand, but uh, I think a spreadsheet's kind of nice, and I'll show you the, the spreadsheet that I made to do this problem after the break. So let's take about 10 minutes. Do you want me to... Oh yeah, before we go, before we go. Before or after, what do you want? Go ahead. Okay, so I'm about to release your grade 
from the last homework assignment. The other thing that you will see is in course content, I've added a uh, document that is interpretations for all the gamma and tau from homework two because there was, I think a lot of people were confused and there was not uh, sometimes a lot of space on the homeworks to put comments. So it seemed easier to put them all in one document. So a lot of you will see on your homeworks, it'll say something like, see the interpretation notes. That's so I didn't have to keep doing it over and over and squeezing it into places, right? Yeah. Um, and I also added a few little, like, yeah. little side notes to kind of help clarify, like, just to kind of say, like, oh, remember about this or remember about that, that were not necessarily things that I was expecting you to put in the homework, but I thought would just maybe FYI. FYI that might help you to kind of make sense of what we were doing. So you should not look at the interpretation guide as, like, this is like, this is what we were expecting you to produce, like in full, just like this. And if you didn't do that, you got points off because that's not the case. But it has all of the interpretations for group mean and grand mean centered, all of the coefficients, all of the variance components. And then it also has some like little side notes to kind of help pull everything together. And that is where did you post it? It's in course content. And I moved it up so it's near the top. Um, and also, given like what we just talked about. I just want to caution you that these are not templates for what your responses to your next homework should be, because obviously, as we're seeing, like things, the interpretation of, of it, an, an estimate or a parameter or whatever changes depending on the context of the model. Totally. So I don't want you to like cut and paste. To like, honestly, in regression, you could always kind of that. You could say, so one unit increase in this, you would expect an increase in this. It's, it's a little more complicated here. Yeah, you got it. You can't just always just like kind of this. It's hard to say like cookie cutter 100% of the time. Just say it this way. Right? You really have to think about the context, the way things are centered, the way. You know, what, what cross, you know, what interactions are in there, et cetera, et cetera. So. Alright, so let's take a break and come back in about 10 minutes. So here is, oops. Okay, so here's the question. Do you all feel confident about this now? Uh, or would you like to do like another example of something like this? Or are you ready? Or do you feel like you're good? Okay, I, what does yes mean? Does yes mean more or? Sure. Let's do the, that's a great idea. I think that's awesome. Let's do the example in there. Okay, so let's do the first. E what? Yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so let's do. You're talking about the first one, right? Because there are multiple. Part two, number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do part two, number one. Okay, so here we go. Let's read through it first and then we'll do it. So what's the model predicted score for a private school student who scores two standard deviations above their school's mean in math in kindergarten and whose SES is one standard deviation below their school's mean, who attends a school, I mean, it's like, who attends a school whose school mean kindergarten math achievement is one standard deviation below the mean and whose school SES is one standard deviation above the mean. A lot to hold in your head, so you definitely are going to need to write some stuff down. And I need my pens here. Okay, so let me. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do here is get things into the right view. It's not always just one standard. Go raise the other one. Yeah, supposed to release at 10 30. Let me double check. Okay, oh, that's weird. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is say, like, okay, how many units? Like, so I've got math. I so math, kindergarten, centered. 
I said it was two standard deviations above the school mean, and a standard deviation was 7.98, right? So two times 7.98 is actually 15.96. So I'm really saying that it's 15.96 units above the school mean, right? Okay. And SES group centered was I wrote this down right. I said SES, their uh, group center, the kid is one standard deviation below their school's mean. That's going to be negative one times, check and make sure this is the right, 0.58. Yep. 5.8. So that's negative. Five eight, right? And then school math center. School math center, I said, hold on, school mean, school math center is one standard deviation below the mean. So negative one times, check to make sure I get the right numbers here. 5.13 is negative 5.13. Right, and the school's SES is one standard deviation above the mean, so that is mean SES is equal to uh, 0.57, positive 0.57 units because it's just one standard deviation, and a standard deviation is 0.57 units. And the kid is a private school student, so for private, I'm gonna plug in one. So those are all like the plug-in numbers that I need, right? And so now I'm gonna put those. So then the question is like, well, I don't know, do I do I do this? You can you can approach this one of two ways. We were sort of doing it in the combined equation, but the other option would be that you could actually plug things into the multi-level equation. It doesn't actually matter whether you use the multi-level equations or the combined equation. Um, we have a preference. Fine. You like combined? Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to actually show you, uh, I'm going to show you an Excel spreadsheet that I put together for this problem because I think it's sort of helpful, sort of easy to do this in a spreadsheet. I think, um, by the way, this is not the only way you could put a spreadsheet together to do this. This just happens to be the way. That made sense to me. So, with that caveat, okay. Did you start the recording? I did start the recording again. Let me just double check. I'm pretty sure I did. I did. Recording is in progress. Great. Oh, how do I make the font bigger? I mean, I will share it, but, but like, Oh, you mean share it like share? I not. I thought I was still sharing my screen, but maybe I'm not. But I still want to make it bigger. Let's see. Use the zoom at the bottom right. Yeah, right there. That's a good. That's a good idea. Oh, look at that. That is nice. Let's just check and see if I am still sharing stuff. Oh, maybe I'm not. Share go. Share content. Screen one, share. Okay, there we go. So now I'm sharing my screen, and I will I will post I will post this for you. Okay, so this actually, I kind I I don't know I kind of like this because I'm kind of I've kind of set it up a little bit with like the multi level equations. So here's what I've got. Right, I've got. Uh, Private, five eight units. I feel like that's only got one unit. Hold on. Five point three. Well, we can just change it actually because we've got all the numbers here, so it doesn't matter. Let's just go put it in here, and I'll show you how this works. Okay. So these 
are my have multiple sheets here, so I guess it's that's the one that is gender. So this is demo. Okay. So this is the right one. This is the public private one. Okay. So here are my coefficients right here. So I put, see how I've got gamma not not, gamma not one, gamma not two, gamma not three, gamma not four. And by the way, so I just brought the coefficients into Excel with my names for my gammas, and then I sorted them. Because to me, this makes more sense. I wanted like all the gamma nots to go together, and then all the gamma ones, and all the gamma twos, right? And I just want to make sure this is the same model. And then here are my coefficients, right? And then in this next column, it was like, how many units is this person like, or what, well, or the school above or below the 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 mean, right? Um, so let's start with the intercept. So here's the intercept, gamma not not. It's an intercept. So it's an intercept is always going to get multiplied by one. Right? That's just sort of the nature of an intercept. So school, let's check this, school math centered is 1.42, right? And we said, what did we say? We said that they were one unit below the mean on school math centered. So I put in here negative 5.13, right? Okay, great. And then I have mean SES is one, one or so one standard deviation. Mean SES, I said they're one standard deviation unit above the mean on mean SES. So I'm plugging in the 0.57 that I had over there, right? And that's going to get multiplied by my coefficient. And then public private is always just going to, like, you could actually center public private or whatever, but we didn't. It's uncentered. So it's always just going to be a zero or a one. So the units here is it's a private school student, right? So private is one, right? And then uh, mean SES multiplied by public private is mean S is really is really 0.57 times one, right? Because you know, it's mean SES times public private, right? So that's still going to be 0.57. Everybody with me there? Okay. So let's just check our other numbers though. Math root. Yeah, I was going to say math group centered. Here, this one is this one is not changed. So math group centered 1.33 is the right number, but we said in our example that it's two standard deviations above the mean, right? So we said, yeah, that's going to be 15.96. So I put in 15.96 here, right? Got it. Okay. And now I've got math group centered. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. No, I'm messing myself up. Scratch that. That's not the way I organized it. This is the intercept for the math group centered slope. Okay. So actually, here's my 15.96. My 15.96. Okay, so I go through and what I'm doing, so this is like, this is like a multi-level test. So what I'm going through and I'm doing is I'm saying, what's beta not J? Beta not J is a function of gamma not not, gamma not one, gamma not two, gamma not three, gamma not four. I multiply these together and these together, these together, these together, these together. I add them and I get my beta not J. Does that make sense to everybody? Now I get... I want to get my, so again, I'm thinking of this in terms of multi-level rather than combined. So I'm like, okay, I want to know what my beta 1j is. So my beta 1j is really going to be a function of, like, it's going to be a function of the um, school math by the math grouping, right? So I've got this beta 1j is a function of, Right again, remember the substitution. Beta 1j is gamma 1 naught times 1, 
but it's going to be gamma one one, right? Times. Now I wish I had my multi-level equations up there. So gamma one one times. I need to remember. Are we doing math? Are we doing mean SES? What's my one? One is math, right? So it's gamma one not times one, and it's gamma one one times school math, which is the school math center, right? And if I add these two things together, then I actually get, or well, multiply, multiply and then add these two things together, I actually get my beta 1j. So that's, what that's saying is like, in this school, right, this is what, this is what the like beta 1j would be predicted, like in this school for this kid. But now I take this and I'm going to multiply it by the 15.96 because this kid is two standard deviations above their mean. And then I can do the same thing here. So it's really easy here because I just have a gamma two naught. So there isn't any kind of cross level interaction. So I've got 4.17 times one, right? And well, actually, if I take that back, there is a cross level interaction here. And then I've got SES by mean SES, right? And so I get my gamma two one and I can get my gamma two sub J. So basically what I'm doing is I'm coming up with my predicted not gamma two, beta two sub j. I'm coming up with my predicted beta, so my predicted beta j's. And then over here, I'm saying, how many units should that be multiplied by? One for the intercept, because it's the intercept. Here, it's 15.96, because I'm multiplying it by SES, root mean center. Here, it is math kindergarten root mean center. How do I keep doing that? Math kindergarten root mean center. Here it's multiplied by negative 0.58 because it's actually now it's the SES, right? Root mean centered. And if I add, if I multiply all these out and I add them together, I get my predicted Y. But you can see, I mean, you can look at the formulas and you can see that I'm literally just taking these multiplied plus these multiplied plus these multiplied. So that you might not like this. You could totally, so I will post this, but you would totally set this up as combined and you might like the combined better. The reason that I like this is because I kind of like being able to see how the betas are changing as well as how the predicted values are changing, right? Like I, I kind of like thinking about it in those two pieces. I have a tendency to really think about multi-level models as multi-level, but I'll be fair, to be fair, it would be a lot easier to set up a spreadsheet and just literally take the combined equation and just have one massive Excel sheet, right? Where you have, I mean, again, I would suggest that you, I mean, you, you could do that here. You have all of your gammas, right? You have all of your units or whatever. You would set it up slightly differently and then just set up one big sort of multiplicative plus the sum equation in Excel. I've seen people set up spreadsheets a variety of different ways. I think it's really what works for you. I can tell that people do not like my spreadsheet. I was so proud of this spreadsheet. I had ugly versions first. You should see my first try. It was even uglier than this. But um, I mean, that's part of the problem, I think, with anything. Like, this is like a lesson for you in terms of, like, stats in general. Like when you do stuff, it totally makes sense to you. And then you show it to somebody else and they're like, what? Why did you do it that way? And then I look at it and you think, well, like, I can see where that would be confusing. But it did, totally made sense to me when I was doing it. And it does make sense because I really like having my beta not J, my beta 1J and my beta 2J. So I'm really, it re oh, I do wish we had not erased the equation. So it really does, this follows the multi-level equation. But again, you could do it as a combined equation. We could write, let's write the combined equation and let's do it out. You ready? Who wants to write? Yeah, write it on the board. Do you want to write it or do you want me to write it? Do you want to just tell me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's see. Okay. The pens. Yeah. What'd you get? Well, you should get the same thing I did. Uh... <laughs> What'd you get? 
Yeah. All right. That's the right answer. Okay. You want to write it out yourself, or do you want her to write it? Yeah, do you want to write it? I can do it myself. All right. This is better. Write numbers? Yeah, go ahead and just write the numbers. You don't have to write the whole equation out. Just write the numbers. I think people can follow along with the numbers. Have the equation on this one. Yeah, everybody should. You should all have the equation. So it's just a matter of plugging in the numbers for the combined equation, right? Those X's are all multiply signs, by the way. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that looks, yeah, I was kind of following along. That looks right, like it's, I think that's right. Yep. And when you add that all together, you get? Yeah, that's okay. So now go ahead and write what it equals. <laughs> <laughs> don't make people, don't leave people hanging. Oh, okay. I didn't mean that. I just meant the whole sum of it, but okay, thanks. Equals, there we go. One, four, okay, thank you. That is great. Yay! Let's give you a big round of applause because we're brave enough to write all that on the board. Okay, so that is the way you would do it with the combined equation. Maybe this, now maybe, now maybe when you look at mine, you won't think it seems so crazy anymore. Uh, because again, like the rationale, again, we get the same answer. Of course you would, versus combined versus multi-level. Um, and I can see all the pieces. But like, let's just look for a minute at like this 0.09, the negative 0.09. Here's the negative 0.09 here. Remember, is this cross-level, like is that gamma 1, 1? It was that cross-level interaction. And so to come up with like my 
beta sub one J, I was saying, oh, take gamma one one times negative 5.13, because that was the level two, right? Plus 1.33, which was the gamma one naught times one. And when I add those together, I get that beta one J slope of 1.79, and I multiply that by 15.96, which here was the two times 7.8. Look, right, you can see that that's kind of showing up in two different places here. Got this like two times 7.98 times, right, like here we've got this, the neg we've got the negative 0.09 times the two times 7.9, right? Uh, and then here we've got the, Two times seven point nine eight times the one point three. So you see over here, what I was saying is like, oh, I'm going to get my beta one sub j, right? I figure that out. It's one point seven nine. Then I'm going to multiply it by the two times seven point nine eight. Whereas here, it's showing up in the dividing model in like two different. Do the same thing, but I've got like. I've got the 1.33 part, it's the gamma one not part, right? Multiplied by the two times seven nine eight. And then I've got the gamma one one part times the 2.798. You see that? See how like the math is absolutely identical. So you can do it your way, whichever way you like. The reason that I like this is because it helps me personally to kind of see how all the pieces are fitting together and how like, right? Like I can now sort of think about how the betas are changing as a function of like the level two variables and then how the beta then gets multiplied by the level one variable. And so for me, I like this because it like, it makes sense to me and it sort of falls with like the way that I think about multi-level models, but it is absolutely 100% mathematically identical to doing this. It's just that when I look at this, I have to like get my bearings about like, right? whereas the way I've organized it here, at least to me, it's like, it makes sense. Does not matter. Also does not matter. You can do this on paper. You can do it in Excel. Doesn't matter at all. You might want to do the first one on paper just to get your bearings. But I'm guessing by like the second or third, you might get more like, complicated. <laughs> well, I was gonna say you might be like, I don't want to do this again. Let me let me put this in Excel. If you do it in Excel, please attach your Excel spreadsheet. If you do it on paper, please like just you know take a picture of or upload your pen and paper. You do not need to type this out. If you want to? That's fine. But like that could take hours just typing everything. It's totally fine to handwrite it. Yes. Question. Oh, it's not happy it's because I have parentheses of the negative value. Yeah. So which part I, I'm which part are you confused about? So like all those I talk about the like the minus one point four six times. You know which which numbers are the extra numbers? Oh, are you? Yeah, so like this, this right? I don't think it matters because they are all multiplied by. Yeah, I, I don't think follow, follow the gamma. I don't, don't follow the gamma. Yeah. Like on this one. The one, okay, which like the next to so this part, not this one. The oh, the negative point oh nine. Okay, so the negative point oh nine is right. That is uh, that's our gamma one one, right? Yeah, gamma one one. It's gamma one one. Okay. And it's getting multiplied by. Or I actually have labeled my things with gammas because here we go. Here I've got my gammas, right? So the negative point oh nine is gamma one one, and it's getting multiplied by. This was the number of standard deviations, right? So this is like the 
this part is the two point, right? You know what this is, right? That's the uh, mass K group C, how many units above the mean? And then the negative 0.53 is the small mass K. I'm going to say it right because time school mass K. And this was one standard deviation unit below the mean, which is where we're getting the negative 0.5.13. Negative 5.13 or there. And because we're going to use the model, right, we're explicitly doing the cross level interaction as a multiplication, like all at once here. So it's gamma one one times the like mat like the group mean centered mass k units right times the school mass, which follows with if you look at your combined equation, unfortunately we erase. If you look at the combined equation, you will see that as part of it was plus gamma one one times school mass centered, right? Times, wait, that is not that center, times math group center. Okay. There we go. Gamma one one, right? And that is, so this is gamma one one. This piece is the math group center, and this piece is the school math. How many units above or below the unit? Yeah. And then if we do that same thing here, so at negative 0.5, and let's see, negative 0.57 times negative 0.58. So this piece was our gamma 2 one, right? Negative 1.46, yeah, is our SEX group center. So this should be our, this is the mean SEX, how many units above the mean, right? Times this negative 0.58 was SES center. And it was one standard deviation below the mean, right? And then this is actually our gamma, this should be gamma 2, 1, right? Times, and again, when you look at the way we wrote it out, it was plus gamma 2, 1 times like school SES times uh, group mean center SES, right? Okay. And so that's why we're getting, so it's like th these pieces are the interaction terms that we're explicitly multiplying and then these are our gamma's. Yeah, sure. Does that make sense? Okay. You can beat the dead horse here. So are we good? Everybody ready to do the homework? All right. I think so. So, so again, for homework, you're going to do something just like this. You can do it on pen and paper. You can do it in an Excel spreadsheet. You can do it combined. You can do it multi-level. It doesn't matter. The first thing you're going to be asked to do is to write the multi-level. I'm going to give you something just like this. It's going to be like output, right? You need to like label the gammas, write the write the multi-level equation, write the combined equation, use either the multi-level equation or the combined equation to solve five problems, five little word problems about prototypical types of people. And just be careful, like check whether it says like units or standard deviation units. If it's, I give you the standard deviations, but if it says standard deviation units, make sure that, you know, you're just like we did in class today, that you're plugging in standard deviations and not just using like you know, if it says one unit above the mean, then make it one unit above the mean. But if it says one standard deviation unit above the mean, then make it whatever, like if the standard deviation is 0.57, then it would be 0.57 units above the mean. So I think that's one place where people sometimes go wrong. That's just a, like a reading thing. Run it. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we've only got like half an hour, but that's okay. Um, so have you enjoyed your reprieve from R or are you ready to go back to it? Okay, sure, no problem.
Um, okay, so let's see. But again, different numbers for the homework, right? Different models. So it's only going to be moderately helpful. Okay. So here we go. So our next big topic, and one of my personal favorite topics, is um did I really did I just like it can she see the slides? Okay. All right. This is one of my personal favorite topics. We're going to talk about longitudinal analyses and it's yes. No, I'm not sharing. Okay. Can't manage that. Makes sense. Okay. Hold on. Share. Screen one. Share. Okay. Now, are we good? Yes. Cool. Okay, here we go. One of my personal favorite topics. I love longitudinal models, and we're specific. We're going to talk about one specific type of longitudinal model in here. There are other types of longitudinal models. We're going to talk about growth curve models, individual growth curve models, um, and and multi-level models are particularly well suited for reasons that we'll talk about for actually estimating growth models. Um, in some ways, they're better. They're be it's better in multi-level modeling than it is in, in structural equation modeling for certain kinds of things. So this is my very meta graph of growth and growth modeling articles over like <laughs> the last 20 years. Although I was looking at it, I need to update it now. Add 2020 and 2021. Yeah, 40, years. 40 years, sorry. I'm, I'm, I look at 1980. Yeah, it does say 1980, doesn't it? It is 40 years. I remember 1980. Not like it was yesterday, though. It was a long time ago. But I do remember, sure. which is bad. Okay. Anyway. All right. So first thing, um, there's this very famous uh, quantitative methodologist named Jack McArdle. And he uh, did a lot of work on longitudinal modeling, especially in an SEM framework. But he would always sort of start out his talks and, and many of his papers and books by saying, what's your model for change? And that might sound like a really simple question, but it's actually quite deep and really, really important. Because again, I, I hope that you're getting the idea from this class that like modeling is not just, it's modeling is very different from running a t-test, right? Running a t-test is like a t-test, but modeling is really about modeling. Like you're modeling your data. So you have to understand what is the model? What's your model for change? Like you could have longitudinal data and just because you have longitudinal data, it doesn't even necessarily mean that you're expecting growth. If you think about it, think about all the different kinds of longitudinal data that you could collect. Sometimes we might actually be interested in stability. How stable are people across time, right? How much does where I am, how much does where I am today, how well is that predicted by where I was yesterday or last year or 50 years ago, right? That's very different kind of question than, you know, thinking about growth. And there are other kinds of longitudinal models as well, but I think two very basic types are sort of autoregressive models where we're really thinking about sort of how well does where I was predict where I am, which is not at all the same question as like, are people growing or declining, right? Or, you know, how, what does that growth look like? Uh, how well can I predict people's growth? You know, and so again, we're going to be thinking about change here. We're not going to be doing autoregressive models. We're thinking about change. So we're thinking about growth models. And growth models, though, again, they implicitly or explicitly assume that you are expecting either growth or decline across time. If you think people aren't going to change across time, again, I know this sounds really obvious, but I've seen this over and over. If you don't think people are going to change, you don't need a growth model. You need a non-growth model, right? We'll talk about some other ways that you can model non-growth, but, but a growth model is for modeling growth, and growth can be positive or negative. So it doesn't have to be a positive change. It could be a negative change, right? So it could be growth or decline. So before you ever get started, like even collecting data, really, ideally, um, 
although maybe you're not the one collecting longitudinal data because frankly, I would recommend against it. Definitely for your dissertation, it's very time consuming and you don't wanna do a longitudinal dissertation or you might never graduate. Uh, it's way better to get other people's longitudinal data. I mean, you know, there are longitudinal studies that have been going on for like 50, 60 years, right? Uh, you, know, you don't want to wait around for 50 or 60 years to be able to analyze data. So secondary data is great for longitudinal. But anyway, but if you're designing a study or if you're about to embark on a secondary data analysis, you should be asking yourself like, well, okay, am I first, am I expecting growth or decline? Right? Like, I'm going to fit a growth model. Am I expecting the growth to be positive, negative, or am I not expecting growth at all? You should certainly know the answer to that question before you ever open a data file. And then the second question you should know before you ever open a data file, and again, know, like, I think, again, like a, a, something I'd like you to take away from this class is you should have a priori ideas about how to model your data, but you should also be flexible enough to know when you're wrong, right? So, like, uh, you should have an idea about whether you think this growth is going to be linear or nonlinear. You might be wrong. You might think it's going to be linear, and then when you actually start working with the data, you might discover that it's severely nonlinear. But like, you need to be thinking about that up front because we're going to be modeling the shape of the growth trajectory. That's going to be a lot of what we talk about in future weeks. And so we need to sort of understand what shape growth trajectory are we expecting. And it's also really important because uh, I'm jumping ahead a tiny little bit, but if I've got a linear growth model, I only need three time points to fit a linear model. And that's because you only need three, well, it's going to sound silly, but you only need three time, you only need three points to fit a straight line and have some error. If you have two points, put two points anywhere in this room, right? And you could draw a line between those two points and it would fit perfectly. Right, so there's no disconfirmation possible. But take three points and put them anywhere in this room, and you couldn't, I mean, Nate could draw a straight line through all three points, but not necessarily, right? So three is sort of the lowest number of points that you could have and actually fit a linear trajectory and still have there be room for error of some sort. And that's really kind of conceptually the logic behind why we need to have three time points to fit a linear model. I'll say a little bit more about that. If we think we're gonna have nonlinear growth trajectories, like, again, when I say linear, I'm thinking, imagine like, linear trajectory, three points, that works. Well, what if I think, think that my trajectory is going to be linear? What would that be saying? That, that would be saying like, true, but that would be saying like, saying like, okay, people start here and at first, they're slow. And then they go to a spurt and they grow very, very quickly. And then at the end, they grow slowly again, right? Can anybody think of something that might follow that kind of pattern? Measured it for now. Again, also depends on the time scale. Have a long, you know, depending on how long you're collecting data, the shape of the trajectory might look different. So if you collect it from here to here, but if you collect this whole thing, it looks like this. Can anybody think of an example? follow a trajectory like that? That's exactly what I was thinking. Language development, like vocabulary growth, right? I mean, you know, kids are born and they say absolutely nothing for a while, right? Tail's not quite right. Whatever. Probably too steep. But the, the same, the basic idea holds that like kids don't say anything for the first year or two. And then there's an explosion of growth in terms of vocabulary words, like two and five or two and six or two and eight or whatever, tons and tons and tons of new vocabulary words that until kids stop, again, quite as, quite as severe as this curve. But once you get to adulthood, how many new words do you learn a year? Your PhD program, maybe you have less new words. 
Yeah, you might have a little spurt from the general. Yeah, 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 exactly. If you're in a stats class, you have to, but in general, adults learn as compared to little kids who are like ages three, four, and five, even adults in PhD programs learn very few words compared to like little kids. So you could imagine that you might expect a trajectory that looks something like this. And again, as I said, the shape of the trajectory also depends on how long you're collecting the data. If you only have data until age three or four, you might expect the trajectory to look like this, right? And if you have data until age 90, maybe it's like, you know, it's really depressing. Jack McCardle actually did a lot of research in gerontology. And so he looked at cognitive decline as a result of this cognition from like ages 50 to 90 or something. But again, if you were looking at cognition, it might look really like a downhill curve from 50 to 90, but if you go from birth to 90, a different trajectory, like probably this and then a long plateau and then eventually. Anyway. Um, let's hope it doesn't go down too much more before the end of the semester. Or year. All right, so that's so, but you know how long how long you collect the data obviously is going to affect the the shape of the trajectory. And then the other kinds of questions that we want to know are things like you know, do often in longitudinal studies do people kind of start out in the same place? Are they similar to each other initially? Um, you know, that doesn't have to necessarily be a question, but it often is. And then do people grow at the same rate or do they grow at different rates? And if they grow at different rates, what predicts what predicts those differences in growth? Do people start in the same place or in different places? And if they start in different places, what predicts the differences in terms of where people start? Okay, so we're like really interested in how does the outcome change across time and can we predict differences in those changes. And how does the outcome change over time? That's really going to be, we really need to get a good model for this trajectory. And then can we predict differences in the change across time? We're going to be thinking about, you know, like person often, uh, mostly between person, but they could also be within person uh, variables that help to predict differences in change across time. I shouldn't say mostly, they could be either. Okay. So like here's a here's a little plot of individual growth plots for a sample of 20 students on a reading test. And we'll actually use these data next week um, for our first example for a longitudinal model. And the kids were tested at ages six, eight, and ten. Um, and all of you can't really Y axis and x axis same across these little 20 individual growth plots. By the way, if you're doing growth modeling uh, with your own data, the very first thing you want to do is look. This would be before you ever get into the multi level modeling of it. You want to look at these individual growth plots. Like you want to actually plot for each person what does what does each person's growth look like across time? Because that will help you to see. Do, do, do I need a linear model? Is, does it seem to be linear? In this case, we only have three time points. So we have to hope it's linear because we can't do anything more complicated than that. So, um, but you know, which again, that's why you want to think about if you really, if you really wanted to model something like that S shaped curve, if that were what you wanted to look at, the answer is you need more than three data points to model that, right? Like you, so the sort of the more complex the trajectory, the more time points you need. But again, let's just think here about this, these 20 kids. What do you notice about the kids in terms of where they start? Do they all seem to start at the same place? Do they start at different places? How much, you know, what does it look like? On average, do they seem to start low or high or how much variability is there? What do you think? Yeah, generally low. I mean, most of them seem to start out pretty low, right? At that sort of that lowest bar around 20, right? Somewhere in there. But there are exceptions, like you've got number 17 up here, who actually starts more at like, like around 40, right? Now, this is a very strange case, too, because this is reading growth from ages 6 to 10. And this kid started out very high 
and got worse over the next four years. So this is a kid that we very concerned about, right? This is not normal reading growth at all. Um, so yeah, so like who's messing with the data? But anyway, so this is this is strange. But in general, it seems like there's you know kids are so starting out low, and there's not a ton of variability in terms of where kids start. There's a little. There's some, right? About how fast they grow. So now we're talking about their slopes, their linear growth slopes. Does it look like kids, is there a lot of variability in terms of how fast they grow? Yeah, actually, it seems like, you know, you've got some kids who are negative in terms of their growth, some kids who are flat, basically aren't growing at all, and other kids, like this kid, number one, whose growth rate is super, super fast, right? Super steep. So it seems like there's actually, like, it seems like in general, if I wanted to sort of say in general, does it seem like growth is positive or negative in general? Positive. Totally fair to say in general, looks like we would expect positive growth. And, but it also looks like there's a fair amount of variability across people in terms of that growth. Right? Maybe even more variability in terms of, and then they're not on the same metric necessarily, but like at least visually, looks like more variability in terms of growth than there is in terms of where kids start. But again, if you know anything about little kids and reading, that absolutely makes sense because when do kids start to learn to read? Around age six. So I would actually expect that there would be less variability. And in fact, if you thought about how much variability is there at age 10? You know, so in terms of where kids end up versus where they start out, do you see that there's way more variability in terms of age 10 scores that there is in terms of age six scores. And again, developmentally, that makes absolute sense. Okay. So this is, these are the kinds of, like, this is cool. I might want to fit a model where I actually allow, I've got, I've got observations here across time and they're clustered within people. And so instead of thinking about people being clustered within classrooms or schools or businesses or whatever, I'm going to think about observations being clustered within people. And so now I could have, I could totally reframe my model so that the person is the cluster and I could actually have randomly varying intercepts and randomly varying slopes for each person, right? Is everybody kind of with me? So like, yeah, so I'm going to reframe this model. So I'm going to, instead of thinking about people nested within schools, now I'm thinking about time points nested within people. So I've got these three, every person in this little example, they all have three time points and those time points are clustered, clustered within person. And it's very clear that those observations are not going to be independent within person, right? There's going to be a strong amount of dependence, and we can talk about how to model that a little later, but I mean, part, part of that is taken care of with this model, and we'll talk about other things too, but I've got time points nested within person. So I've got observations across time. That's going to be my level one variable is like, or my level one model is going to be about observations across time are going to be clustered or nested within people, and people are gonna be my level two units. So if you have a longitudinal study, the person ID is actually the cluster ID because the person is their own cluster. And I have multiple observations within person and the person becomes their own cluster. And cool, right? And if the person becomes their own cluster, that means I could get a randomly varying intercept and a randomly varying slope for each person, which means, let's just say for a second, I haven't, Again, centering, centering. I always have to think about how am I centering things to know how to interpret the intercept. I'm going to throw a different centering strategy at you right now. The most common centering strategy for longitudinal data is to center at the initial time point. So in this case, it would be like center at age six or center at the beginning of the study. If I center so that zero is age six reading score or reading at the beginning of the study, then my intercept is going to tell, like, I'm going to get an, I'm going to get an intercept, which is going to tell me about, like, the, you know, the fixed effect for the intercept is going to tell me about the average score at age six. And I'm going to get variance in that intercept, which is going to tell me how much between person variance is there in terms of where kids start. That's interesting, right? 
So I'm going to get like, on average, kids start with a score of 20, and there's this much between person variability in terms of where kids start. And then I'll also get some sort of a, an average slope, right? Or, a, you know, so I'll, I'll get like, uh, you know, this, let's say the slope is positive. Uh, on average, kids grow five points a year, let's say, in terms of their reading scores on average, that's going to be like, yeah, you know, the intercept for the slope. And then, but then there's also going to be between person variability in the slope. So how much variability is there in terms of how fast kids grow? So that's really interesting, right? So I get sort of like on average, where do people start and how fast do they grow? And then also how much between person variability is there in where people start and how fast they grow? And if there's a lot of between person variability in where people start and how fast they grow, can I find variables that will help me to predict why some people start higher or lower, why some people grow more quickly or more slowly? Uh, yeah, we well, we call it centering at an initial time point. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about centering here. So just just so if we're gonna do growth curve modeling to get on the board, we need a few things. Again, these are gonna sound really obvious, but they're super important. I have to have at least three waves of data. I can't do a growth model without three time points. Now, let me just throw out there. I'm going to be able to handle missing data pretty easily here. So like if there are, are if there are some people in your study who didn't show up for the third like didn't show up for the middle time point or the third time point, like that's okay. You don't have to throw them out of your data set the way that would happen if you used repeated measures ANOVA, but you need to be collecting three time points. So like some people might only have one or two time points, but you want, you know, the majority of people to have at least three time points. I also need a substantively meaningful metric for time. And let me just go back here for a second. Why is that so important? Well, because time is what's time or age, some sort of a time variable is going to be what is on the X axis here. Right? So if I want to look at growth across time, I have to be able to relatively accurately sort of clock the passage of time. So, and how accurately does it need to be clocked? Well, that really depends on your study. I mean, there are people who use growth modeling where milliseconds matter, you know, and there are other people who do growth modeling and they do it in terms of years, you know? So like, what is the right metric for time really depends on your substantive research area, but you do have to have, you have to be able to clock the passage of time and it really should be like interval level, right? So there should be equal intervals. So if you've like, Again, sometimes it's a little more approximate than others, but it's important to have some sort of metric for time that makes sense. Third thing, again, seems really obvious, but you have to have an outcome that systematically varies across time. You gotta, this is what I was saying at the outset, you gotta expect change across time. If you have an outcome that you don't think is actually gonna systematically change across time, then this is the wrong model for you. You don't want a growth model because you're not expecting growth, right? And then the last thing is that the, the dependent variable has to either be the same variable across time or it has to be equatable or comparable across time, right? So it has to be in a metric where you can actually compare it across time. So like if you have, you know, reading scores on three different, you know, reading tests and there's no way to equate those reading tests across time, so the scores mean something completely different, then how you, there's no way to look at growth, you know? So those are really important sort of requirements. Um, I sort of mentioned this earlier, but if we only have two waves, we can't actually figure, we can't really just, we can't separate out, I said, error from the trajectory. So one of the nice things about having three time points is I fit this trajectory, right? And when I fit this linear trajectory here, Look at that point, point, and draw this linear trajectory. Okay, this is like the slope, my growth slope for this person. But there is some amount of like error at each point. I, I'm like, this slope is actually slightly underestimating this person's score at time one. It's slightly overestimating the person's score at time two, and it's pretty close to time three, but it's maybe a slight 
slight underestimate at time three. So, you know, if I only had two weights of data, right, what would I say that the growth rate was? Look at all like the slope that I had, but there's measurement error in each time point. It, like each observation is, you know, again, like going back to just basic measurement. There's a there's there's measurement error in you know it's a combination of sort of like whatever the true true score is or the true trait and measurement error. And there's no way to disentangle the true score and the measurement error. When you only have two time points, because you are really sort of taking right, you're sort of taking as sort of gospel or whatever you're taking as truth what each of those points is. Whereas if you have at least three points, I can fit this slope and say is probably a much better representation of this person's growth rate than just looking at this, just looking at this, right? Does that make sense? So that's. So that's kind of why we need at least three time points worth of data. Um, and I, you know, as I said, the outcomes have to be equally valid across all measurement occasions. So just using the same test doesn't necessarily completely solve the problem. And I'll, so we got to sort of think about validity issues here. So, for example, a multiplication test might be a really good measure of math skill for a little kid, but a multiplication test is actually a really lousy measure of math skill for an, like a high schooler or a college student, right? It's more a test of memory at that point, probably. Um, and so, you know, it's not just like you can't just say, oh, I'll just use the same test always because this test it may have floor effects or ceiling effects. It may not be equally valid across all those time points. Um, and just another thing to remember is this is true whether you're doing a two time point study or a growth study. The reliability of change measures is a function of the reliability of the outcome variable. So if you have a really unreliable measure, it's really hard to get a good solid measure. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like to get a good measure of change, you need to start with good, you know, reliability on the measures that you're using. Um, but but reliability of the measurement of change is not just a function of the reliability of the outcome measure. It's also a function of the number of waves of data that you collect and the spacing of the waves of data collection. So um, if you collect more data, I mean, that kind of makes sense, right? If you collect more data, then you can get a better estimate of that growth trajectory than if you have less data, right? If you have fewer observations, I shouldn't say data. I'm talking about observations across time. All right. And I'm not going to say that right now. I'm just going to stop with, I just want to show you one thing. I'll leave you here and we will pick up with this next week. But when we, what we're going to do, this is like our, your little preview of next week. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to reframe our multi-level model so that we can use it to measure growth. And this is going to freak you out a little bit because I just changed our betas and gammas to pies and betas. I know, I know, you got to be flexible, man. Uh, there's a logic to that, by the way. This is well, besides the fact that this is what Rob Bush and Bright do, but the logic is that betas still represent person level, and we could have a three level model, and so gammas would still be the cluster level. But because I'm going within person, I need like a new, I need a new symbol, and so I'm going to use a pi. And so even though at the outset it's like, oh my god. This looks horrible. It, it doesn't actually make sense. And it makes a lot of sense when you put it into a three level model, because then you always know betas are people, gammas are clusters, and pies are going to be within person. But so pretend for a minute that these are betas and these are gammas, right? Like we've got, got random pairing intercept, right? And then we've got this slope, the slope. The randomly varied slope, the independent variable we're going to use is time. We're going to measure time. We're going to clock it. It's going to be a variable in our model, and we're going to be able to fit a slope. And then we're going to have this the E sub TI. Those are exactly what I was talking about there when I drew the little arrows from the dots to the regression line. That's how that's that within person error variance. And then the between person change, okay. Each person has got their own intercept, right? That's going to be predicted by the overall intercept across the whole model. And then there's going to be, it's 
right? I'm also going to have error. And here I would be able to add person level predictors. I don't have that yet. But, and then here each person's got their own slope. And that's a function of the overall slope. And then also this person's slopes deviation from the overall slope, right? So overall intercept and how far does this person deviate from the overall intercept? Overall slope, how far does this person deviate? And then here I'm going to be able to take these R's and what am I going to get? Variance components, right? I'm going to get a tau matrix just like I did before where I can look at between person variability and where people start, how fast they grow, and what would the covariance be here? The relationship between where people start and how fast they grow, which I would argue is way more interesting. And in sometimes we don't care about that in organizational studies, but we generally always care about that in longitudinal studies. Yes. Just to clarify, in the previous equations, you had the E as an R and the R as a B. Yeah. So yeah, but same thing because see, the R's are still going with the B. Yeah. And the U's. Uh, see, so everything like moved up a level. And so, but this you should be happy because it's your old friend E from multiple regression. Finally, <laughs> your, old friend. your old friend E is back. Because, like, I think at first people were like, what? Why are we using R? But we do use E. We just use it within person. Okay. I'm going to stop there because it's exactly 12. And we will pick up. I will go back a couple of slides, the ones I skipped. I just wanted you to at least see this. So if you start to percolate in your heads over the next week, um, and we'll pick up with longitudinal models next week, and we'll do some more again next week, too. All right. Thank you. Do you want to repeat my summary, really? I'll try. I'll okay. see. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Oh, wait. The last time I messed up was I did not actually close out. Stop sharing. Stop recording. I mean, for one thing, stop. And I think 